All right, hey, we're gonna get started. We are gonna be, for the next three, four weeks, uh, we are gonna be talking about mountains we die in. Anyone ever heard of the phrase, don't die in that mountain? My wife says that to me a lot. Um, basically, I'm an argumentative person. She says, I told her, no, I'm not. She says, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not, right? And, um, but when you argue about a lot of stuff, you basically, hey, you're, you are taking a stand on something and hey, there's some things that are worth that. And there's some things that are worth taking a stand on, right? If you, if you see someone being murdered in the street, take a stand on that. Yeah. Don't do that, right? Um, but there's all the things that's also, that's just your preference. Let it go. Not a big deal. Uh, but we've heard phrases like, pick your battles. We've heard phrases like, don't make mountains out of molehills. We've heard all sorts of these like, phrases. And it's all kind of with this, hey, there are things in life worth fighting about. There are things w in, in, in life worth being uncomfortable enough to take a stand on. And there's things that are not. There are things that are just, you need to let them go, not because it's not important, but because it's not a major deal. It's not a major like, issue. Um, we are looking at finishing our basement and whatnot, and like, in terms of flooring coloring, I have opinions. My opinions don't matter, right? <laughs> and so it's, hey, do I have an opinion? Yes. Is it worth it for me to weigh in? No, because at the end of the day, I probably don't know what's best. So I'll just trust my wife on that, right? There are things that you just, hey, I am not going to die in this mountain, right? There's, there's just things that I don't need to worry about. But there are other things that are big deals that are worth dying on that mountain over, right? So we're going to be kind of using that phrase throughout this next th three or four weeks, right? Because when it comes to my faith, there's a lot of like potential issues, that could be things that I die on, right? Things of like, well, this is like, there's my preference in things, there's what God's word says, and there's a lot of other things that are maybe just a subjective in there. And so what do I take a stand on? What do I say, this is where I will not move, this is what I will not come off of? There are things like, hey, there are certain types of music I like in church, not worth dying over, right? It's not worth, hey, I'm gonna take a stand here and over my dead body will this happen, right? There are things like, hey, the different versions of the Bible, like, hey, like you may have, I like the NIV, or I like the ESV, or the New King James, whatever that is. Great, not worth dying over, okay? Because as long as it's actually God's word, not like some crazy weird thing, but, all right, there are things that, hey, there's preferential things. There's things that we may have, like, differences from other, like, denominations. Like, you have some that believe a certain thing about, like, hey, this is how you know you're saved. And they say, well, that's not what I believe God's word says. But we're in the ballpark here. We're not going to fight over this, right? And so um, there's, there's several things, though, that are considered just the pillars of our faith. Things that are like, this is what makes Christianity Christianity. This is what it makes following Jesus, following him. And these things we can't move off of. And we're going to be talking about those over the next three or four weeks, not all of them, but like kind of some major ones that we really need to be nailed down on. Uh, things that kind of are just, hey, if we don't have this right, it changes everything. And so we're going to be looking, uh, there's a few different things that we want to kind of start with, right? There are things that we call first order, second order, and third order. So first order is those big major things, right? The fundamental and essentials to the Christian faith. Like the one we're talking about like tonight the humanity and deity of Jesus. That's a major thing that we need to, like, we can't move off of that. Jesus was fully God and fully man, right? That's something we can't move off of. Like, the fact that, hey, we are sinful and in need of a Savior. We can't move off of that. That's a big deal. That's something that's a first order, major thing. It is worth dying on that mountain. But then there's second order, right? Things that are essential to church life and necessary for the ordering of the local church, but in and of themselves, they do not define the gospel. One of those that you could maybe think of with this is we do love baptisms, and we have that big, awesome spa-looking pool thing, right, to where we go down in it. It's nice and warm, kind of, kind of float, maybe get some floaties if you're real scared of that, right? And then we dunk, right? You're fully under, and then back up. Right? There are some like churches um, that see it as more of, hey, you don't have to do that. You can do the sprinkling. You can do things like that. And where we would say, no, we think God's word says this. It's a picture of a full change of life. We don't really think, see it as the dropping of water on the head is kind of doing that full thing. It's also, hey, it doesn't change whether someone is saved or not, right? It's something that we can disagree on. 
but it's not, hey, you don't know the gospel if you do it this way, right? We don't, we don't have to be on the same page 100% on that because it's not a major gospel issue, okay? So things like that. Then there's third order, right? Things that are grounds for fruitful theological discussion and debate, but they do not threaten the fellowship of the local congregation or the denomination. So there's things that says, hey, it's, I don't think there should be drums in church. Okay, let's high five over that. Let's talk about it. And let's move on and we're going to be friends because this doesn't really make a huge difference. Not a major issue. We can talk about it. We can talk about is there a theological side of it. Great. But it's not a major issue. Right? And so we have to learn, right? One of the biggest things that we learn in life as we learn mature in things is what are the mountains that we die on? What are the things that we don't? And as followers of Christ, we need to learn to let go of some things, but in a culture that is constantly pressuring you to not have really a stance that is firm on anything, just to flow with the culture, we also need to be aware of what are the things we will not be moved on? What are the anchor points of our faith that we will not budge off of those because we are just like convinced that this is what the gospel is about, and if I do not stand firm on this, it changes everything, and I'm not following anything. So, all right. First order issues are the mountains that we die in, right? When it comes to our faith, certain things we cannot give in. These are the pillars, and that's what we're going we're to be talking about. This week, we're going to be talking about the mountain that we die in, right? Is the deity and humanity of Christ, right? Jesus being 100% God and 100% man, which is 200% awesome, okay? Right? So, like, you're saying, well, no, mathematically that doesn't work. That's right. It's God, okay? Like if there's, there's just some things you're not going to be able to wrap your mind around. Part of this whole concept is the, the deal of the like, Trinity. We could spend a year talking about that and not have a great graph. So, super brief overview of that. God, we have one God who exists in three distinct persons. Not three separate gods. Somehow, right, it's, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We see throughout God's word that that is alluded to. We see it from Genesis through the New, the New Testament that God is a triune God, right? Not one, there's not one that's higher than the other ones. They work together well. It's not like, hey, this is part God. No, they're all fully God, right? And again, we're not going to wrap our minds on that. Our God is bigger than our understanding. But it's this idea that, and I think the best way that we see it is we have in the Old Testament, right, we have God for us, right? God the Father is kind of who we see the most in the Old Testament. Then we have Jesus comes, he's God with us, right? So we have the Son, God with us. And then after Jesus goes back to heaven, we have God in us, the Holy Spirit. All fully God, all with all the power of God, all the one person of God. Again, it hurts your brain to think about, but that concept, we don't move off of that. And within that, Jesus, the Son of God, is fully God and he's fully man at the same time, right? So there are like certainly beliefs that may go against this like doctrine that we, that you may have heard, you may be aware of. And we're going to kind of talk about a few of them. There's some that believe, hey, Jesus was a man who had the spirit of God in him, right? So kind of the, he was a really good guy and the spirit of God kind of made him extra special to a certain extent, right? Kind of a, I don't know, like Super Mario World, where you get the mushroom, he's a little bit like, bigger, right? He's got that little extra boost in him, right? But, but it's not fully God, fully man, right? Jesus was a man who had the Spirit of God in him. That's a problem, though, right? Because Jesus, as a man, would be sinful. And we'll see in a bit, that's going to be a problem that has to be overcome. Then we have, right, he was half man and half God, right? I can't have 200% of something, so I need 50% God, 50% man. That makes my math brain feel a lot better. There we go. But at the same time, you have that same issue. If he, does, if he only has half the power of God and he only has half of the nature of man, he's still not able to do what he needs to do. And that still changes who he is. He's not fully God. He's still partially man, so he has a sin nature, right? So what is the... Just because I'm trying to make it make sense in my head doesn't mean that it works, all right? Then we have a man who manifested the God principle. That's more of that like a theory like, well, he was a man, but he was God in terms of like how God was like portrayed. But again, if he's still a man who just is kind of a picture of God, he's not God. And if he's not God, he has no authority to pay for your sin and my sin. That's a big deal, right? So then we have, hey, he was a good man, but not God. That is kind of the like, pervasive one, I think, in our culture now. He had some good things. He taught some great things. A good guy. Really great motivational like speaker. Like if he had like Twitter, he'd have a lot of followers, right? People love what he said. But he's not God. 
He had some good things to teach, and that is popular, and that's one of those things that people cling to because, hey, I can take the things I like about what he said, right, and then pick and choose. This is the part about him I don't like. Because he's not God, I don't have to take all of it. I can pick and choose what I think are his good teachings. But again, that's a problem because if he's just a good man, he has no authority to pay for your sin and mine. All right? Then there's this view, hey, Jesus was the, archang the archangel Michael, but he wasn't God. Like, he's a spiritual like, being, right? He's, he's, he's somewhere better than a human, but he's not God. This is the popular with the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? They, there are people that used to come to your door pre-COVID, pre now they just mail you stuff. It's just like, oh, I appreciate your like, zeal here, but like, I get a hand addressed like envelope, I'm like, oh. Oh, come on, you got me again, right? But these are people that come to your door, and their major uh, belief, right, they are Jehovah's Witnesses, the God of the Old Testament, Je um, is like Jehovah God, and Jesus is not the same. They're saying he is not God. Well, again, that's a problem, because if he is not God, he does not have the authority to pay for your sin and my sin. So, that's a problem that doesn't work there. There's also this, Jesus was a prophet. He may be even the greatest prophet, but he's not God. This is what fits within, like, the, the, the religion of Islam, right? Jesus, good dude. He was a prophet. God spoke through him. Great. But he also spoke through Moses and he spoke through like Muhammad and, and he spoke through all of these different like, people. But again, we run into the issue of if he's just a good guy, you and I still have a sin problem that has not been taken care of. All right? And if Jesus is the same as, Mo as Moses, well, we can look at the story of Moses and see he was a messed up guy who sinned and had problems. So does Jesus have sin? If Jesus has sin, he cannot fix my sin problem. It's a problem, right? And then the last one, again, this is not just exclusive. This is not an exhaustive list, but just a bunch of, like, of like different views. Jesus was a man who gained God-like stature. One of the, the religions that I think has the best PR is the Mormons, right? The, G, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But when you really get into what they, they I believe, it is nothing like Christianity. They, because they have this the belief that Jesus was a man who followed all the rules and all the right things and then he got to become a God of his own like galaxy and realm, all right? Well, that doesn't fit. Like, as again, he cannot pay for my sin. I still have a sin problem that has to be fixed and it can't be fixed by a man who's really good. It has to be by someone who is perfect, sinless, spotless and who has the authority to do so. And Jesus would not be able to do that with that view. So, the question would be, why, why do we die on this issue, right? Why, why is this such a big thing? Like, can't I just say, hey, well, you believe what you want, you believe what you want, let's all just get along, right? I am a person that I'd like to not have conflict with in most things. Some things I enjoy it, right? But like, I would love to be able to say, hey, like, you do your thing, and I'll do mine, let's all just be cool and get along. But the issue is, right, just on the, the like, selfish side of, we cannot, we cannot say, hey, there are multiple ways to get to God. There's not, right? And just even if you go to like the, uh, the logical side of you have ways that claim to be exclusive. And if that is not true, then why would you believe any of those ways that claim to be the only way if every way works? Right? So that doesn't work in that sense. But it's also this, we know, right? If we know that the truth is that Jesus is fully God and fully man and the only one capable to pay for your sin and for mine and have the human body to sacrifice and lay down for that, how much do you have to hate someone to say, well, you just believe what you want to believe. I'd rather not have that discussion. Will you just go ahead and think that what, just what you're doing works because I don't want to have anything awkward how much do you have to hate that person to know that they are not headed on the right path? And not that you beat them over the head with it, but to love them and tell them this is what is true. This is what God has laid out for us. We have to take a stand on that because people's lives and, and, their, and, their, and their like eternity are at risk. But the friends and family that you want to make sure things are smoothed over with, they are going to die and go to hell if they don't have this right. That should bother us. It should bother me, it should bother you that there are people in this world that don't know the truth or are believing a lie and that will send them to a hell that is apart from God. And I shouldn't be okay with that. I should want 
to be able to go through an awkward conversation. So yes, I'm going to die in that, on that mountain because I love you so much. And I'm going to die on that mountain because I don't want you to end up where your path is leading you. I care too much about you to let that go. All right? Besides that, right, the evidence is overwhelming. Right? We can look through God's word and see that, hey, Jesus was not just another man. Jesus was not just an angel. Jesus was not just a good guy who had a God principle. Right? We're going to look at God's word and see. This is um, a quote by Dr. James Allen Francis. You all know him uh, from 1928, right? No, I just came across him on the internet. It's fantastic. You should try it. Um, but this is what he said. He's talking about Jesus. He was born in a, in a an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in still another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he traveled and preached. He never wrote a book. He never held any office. He never had a family or owned a house. He did not go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things man usually associates with greatness. He had no no like credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a stake between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone and and like today, he remains the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the fleets that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of men on this planet so much as that one solitary life. Now, Jesus is more than just a man. He is the linchpin of all of human history. And we're going to see God's word lays out very clearly. He is fully God. And as fully God and fully man, he is uniquely positioned for exactly what you and I need. Right? So we're going to talk first, right? Some words that we need to kind of have a, a like grasp on. Deity, right? Equals God. Deity is a God. Right? So if when we're talking about the deity of Christ, we're saying he is God. Now, there's another word, a divinity. It's very close to that, but that's the idea of godlike. Like, man, that chocolate was divine, right? I'm not saying this chocolate is God, right? It was, I'm trying to compare something and say, this was fantastic, it was awesome. It's like this, okay? So, then like humanity, I think we kind of like got this, but just in case, flesh and blood, human physical body, okay? So, that's what we mean by those words. So, we're going to move to, right, Jesus is 100% God. Why is that important? Because as fully God, Jesus... Right? He's an equal part of the Trinity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He is uniquely positioned to have the authority to be sinless and pay our sin debt. That's a vitally important thing. Right? Jesus, as the linchpin of human life history and the linchpin of the entire like, gospel, right? if he cannot pay for your sin, or if his sacrifice for your sin is not valid, everything we're teaching, everything in this book is pointless. Jesus has to have the authority and the ability to pay for your sin and for mine. As, as God, he is uniquely a position to be able to do that. Why? Because he has not sinned. He is the only sacrifice that is not a blemish. He's the only like, sacrifice that is not like tarnished. All right? God himself is the only one that can bear the burden of our debt. His sacrifice is the only thing that will satisfy the judgment and the penalty for our sins. So it has to be God. So Jesus, as the person in Christianity that has died for our sins, he must be 100% God, otherwise he has no authority to pay for your sin and for mine. So is he, right? The evidence for Jesus as fully God. Right? It's going to be on the screen. It's going to have a ton of things here. You can take a picture of it if you want. We'll put it out on social media. This is not exhaustive. This is just a bunch, right? So we have the like, incarnation of God, meaning God becoming man. God coming down and, be, and dwelling with us, right? It's the prophesied about in Isaiah chapter 7. All right, and then we see it come to, 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 
to life fruition in Matthew chapter 1, where we, we start Jesus' birth, right? Christmas time, okay? So we have that it, was like, that it was like prophesied about that God would come down, that God would dwell among men, God himself, and then Jesus is the answer to that. Right. We also see in Micah 5, 2, that he was from everlasting to everlasting, like without the beginning and without end. The only one that is that is God. And this is talking about Jesus, right? This is talking about this Messiah. He's also called God, right? That's kind of a, kind of a just important part, right? He's called God, John 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, right? So he's saying that, that God, that Jesus is God. He is the Word of God. He is God. There's no, there's no like, distinction there. We also see it in Isaiah 9, 6 as well. So that's in the Old Testament. Pushing forward, we see it in the New Testament as well in John 1, 1. He's also called the Son of God, Mark 1, 1. And he claimed to be God, right? That not only was this said about him, but he said, I am God, right? That's a pretty big claim, okay? That's like, no one here has claimed that, Okay? He has claimed that he is God. John 10, 30, John 8, 58, several other times. He was very clear that he is God. In fact, not only did he say that he was God, he pointed back and quoted the Old, the old Testament when Moses is talking to a burning bush and it's the presence of, of God and said, hey, you're going to go to Egypt and you're going to free my people. And in Moses, in the stupidest question ever, who, who shall I say has sent me? And he says, I am who I am. And then this is a quote here. He's saying that I am, right? He's saying not just like I am person, I am Jesus. He's saying I am God. But the God that was talked about then, that's me. He's saying I'm fully God. I'm the God that you've been following your entire life. Right? He claimed to be God. So kind of a big thing there, right? Because the Jews don't take to, very kindly to, to that because they do not I believe that he's God. And the penalty for Someone claiming to be God who is not is stoning, right? And so what happens? They want to stone him, right? The Jews want to stone him. That's the punishment for claiming to be God, but they didn't. And they couldn't. Why? He was God, right? They didn't like, go through with it. Like There was like, something that made them stop, right? He also, right, a very important part, he, he like, forgave sins. I, I can, as much as I want to, say, Dakota, your sins are forgiven. And oh, that's nice. Your sins are still not like, forgiven. Like, I can't do anything about that, right? But Jesus like, forgave sins. Mark 2, 5 through 7, right? It talks about that. And only God can do that. In fact, you have, where you have this woman who is accused of being a like, adulterous woman. And she's dragged out. And they want Jesus to throw a stone at her to kill her and to help kill her. And what is he saying said? He says, go and sin no more. Your sins are like, forgiven, right? He does what only God can. If he's a good, a good like teacher, a good a person that follows the rules, he picks up a stone and he stones her. But he's not just that. He's, he's fully God. Right? But those are things that, hey, those are things that someone can claim that can be said about, like someone that aren't necessarily accurate and true. Right? But he also claimed and demonstrated things that only God can claim and demonstrate. Like what? Right? His omnipresence, with the, which is a fancy word for, hey, he can be everywhere. He's everywhere at all times. Matthew 18, 20, we see that. He's omniscient, meaning he knows everything. Mark 11, 2 through 6. We could go into these, but it'd take us forever. So just look them up on your own afterwards if you want to. I would suggest you do so. Don't just take my word for it. But again, this is where these things are. He also has all power, or his omnipotence. Matthew 28, 18. Right? He, he had power over like, creation. We see in Mark 4 where he's calming the sea. He calms the wind and the waves. As much as you and I may want to do that, how awesome would it be to be out on, even if you go out to Arnold Pond or whatever, at the park there, like a little like, bumpy and, you go, and it goes flat. It's like, yes, that was awesome, right? But you can't. You have no ability to do that. But he did. He's on a massive sea and it swells and rain and wind and just in an instant it's flat, glassy calm. He has power over creation. He also walked on water. Kind of a big deal. I don't care if Chris Angel, mind freak, thinks he can do it. There's some sort of something that's going on there, right? That's not right. Jesus is the only person that did that. In fact, he had like Peter do it. And as soon as Peter thought, hey, I'm walking on water, we sink. And Jesus is like, no, I'm the reason you're able to do that. He had power over creation. He accepted worship. Think of how bold that is if you are not God, right? If you guys walked in here 
say that on like Sunday morning, we sing our couple songs. You guys walk in and you start to sing. And then I walk up front. Like, Come on, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Like, you'd be like, you are the most vain human in the history of mankind. You're a horrible person. Get out of here. I never want to see you again, right? It'd be a ridiculously prideful thing to do unless you're God. Then it'd be the natural thing to do is to accept the worship of others. And it, it either makes him God or he's a like, heretic to accept the worship of other people. But we see in John chapter 20, verse 28. But I think the strongest evidence in God's word for Jesus being fully God comes in Hebrews chapter 1. This one's a little bit longer, but we're going to read it because I think it's super important, okay? Um, verse, starting in verse 1, it says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed, the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Right, just notice that, the exact imprint of his nature. Not like cheap, like copy. Not like, hey, there's a fifth grade art like student trying to m m copy like the Mona Lisa. And it's like, it's in the vague shape of that. Like, this is the exact imprint. He is exactly who God is and what he's about. Right? And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than, than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have begotten you. Or I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the first one into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your like, companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe you will roll them up, like a garment that will be changed, but you are the same and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Right, Jesus cannot be just a good guy. God's word is very clear that he is the exact imprint of God himself. He has no beginning and no end. His throne is forever and ever he is 100% God. That's good for us, right? That's, that's really good news for us. I think it's hard for our culture to accept because if Jesus is 100% God, then the way I interact with him has to change. Jesus, as a good man, I can take what I want. Right? I think Jake's a good guy. Jake can tell me some things that I, that I like and I like agree with. I'm like, yeah, Jake, yeah. I'll take these six things that you say. But Jake may say three or four things that I just totally disagree with. I think he's a good guy. Just nothing against him. But I'm not going to take the things I disagree with. But if Jesus is God, if he is the supreme, uh, just like authority in all of the universe, my creator, the one who made me, who knows me best, then the way I interact with him, the only option is complete like submission to him. But the only option is he knows what's best, whether I like it or not, I'm going with what he says. And we live in a world that does not want to do that. We live in a world that really wants for ourselves, for me to be God of my life, for you to be God of your life. And we run into a problem when there's a God outside of ourselves. And why does our, the world resist that so much? Because we do not want to admit we are not the God of our own lives and that there's someone better to tell us how life should be. There's an authority and there's a, there's a standard that may rub me the wrong way, that may not be what I want to live my life like. And so if I can like convince myself that he is not God, I don't have to listen. But if he is, my life changes. My life should be lived for him. And that's why our world fights that so much. That's why everyone's trying to move you off of that hill that you should die on of Jesus is fully God. It's in his word, and we see it. And it's easier to kind of prove that Jesus was fully a man, right? Because 
He walked the earth. There's a record of him in human life history outside of the Bible. And there's, like, there's proof that he has existed. But we also can't just hold to that Jesus was a spiritual like, being who kind of came down and kind of floated over everything. And like, if he did not physically sacrifice himself for us, are our sins paid for? No, right? Because a debt has to be paid. So Jesus had to be fully man as well. And as a full human, he's uniquely like positioned to empathize with our like, struggles, right? That God knows what we've gone through because he lived that life. But also he had the physical life to sacrifice for us. Fully God and fully man, he is uniquely like positioned for our greatest need in the world. He's the only one that has ever existed, that ever will exist, that can handle and take care of the issue because he's fully God and fully man. Evidence for Jesus, like, just, just like humanity. This one's a lot easier. Jesus was made flesh, John 1, 14. Right? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Pretty straightforward. He has a family tree. Matthew chapter 1. You ever wonder why there's weird lists of names in the Bible? It's like, hey, here's Jesus' great-grandma. Here's his great-grandpa. Like, and kind of just listing. Like, hey, he had a family. He came from somewhere. Like, it's like Ancestry.com before the internet. Okay? My, my mom loves that stuff. Okay. I guess we can find that out. I'm related to Daniel Boone, if you wondered, so... Kind of a big deal. You know, rugged outdoorsman that I am. So, why is it funny? <laughs> so, he was born, right? Always an important thing. Humans are born, right? Jesus wasn't hatched. He didn't get dropped by a stork. He didn't show up in a spaceship. He was born. Christmas morn. Mary. I didn't mean to rhyme that, and it did. Oh, man. All right? Mary would attest to his birth. It wasn't one of those like, oh. Oh, there he is. There was the argh, pushing a baby out, right? Not written. Okay. Mary would know. All right. We see that in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And just in case you don't, know, I believe it. Galatians 4 talks about his birth. He was flesh and blood. All right. Jesus was flesh and blood. We kind of get this picture of Jesus as this like divine, like halo kind of just floats everywhere. Like, but no, he walked. He's flesh and blood. Like, he got dirty. He got cuts on his hands. He was a carpenter. He's probably the only person that hit his thumb with a hammer and felt the pain. Was, mm, not my will, but yours, God, right? <laughs> I, I, that sounded kind of like sacrilegious. It wasn't like he, was, he didn't sin it. He didn't, like, like, he didn't get angry. Like, but, right? but he had these human emotions. He was flesh and blood and felt things. Right? See that in Hebrews chapter 2. Because right? Hebrews chapter 1 is like, hey, Jesus is full of God. Do not doubt that. But then you go to Hebrews chapter 2. It's like, hey, don't just think he floated, right? He was a man and he lived life. He was physically here, flesh and blood. His appearance was as a human. Matthew 26, 48. The Beyonce song, let me see your halo. Jesus didn't have one. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I could. <laughs> Yeah, I think you look it up. It's fine. Honestly, that's the only part of the song I know. So, does someone know the song? Let me see your halo. Let me see your halo. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's very possible. But she says, "Let me see your halo." First of all, if you have a halo, you show that off. You don't hide it. But anyway, we're digressing really quick. So Jesus didn't have a. He looked like a human, right? It'd be very obvious if he was like an alien, right? We've seen signs, like that's kind of a freaky thing, okay? He, he had human flesh, he looked like a human. He was not, in fact, Judas is in the garden and he has to like, and he's talking like, with the guards and he's got to say like, hey, the one I kiss is the one that you're going to kill. Why? He looked like everybody else. Like, Middle Eastern dude in the middle of a garden. Like, you got to be more specific. It was like, the guy with three arms, that's the one. Like, Jesus was not an alien form, weird form. He didn't float everywhere. Did you see that spit go flying? Anyone else? I saw it. All right, so he was human. He got hungry, right? Who all's been hungry? Who's hungry right now? Who smelled the chicken nuggets wafting out of the kitchen there, right? Humans get hungry. Yes, thank you for it. Jesus was a human. He was hungry. We got nuggets though, right? Okay, so you, yeah, you get you some nuggets. Just don't you worry about how. We'll get you some, okay? Sasquatch game reference. There you go. All right. He got hungry. Luke 4, 2. He got thirsty. All right? Things that mark you as a human, you hunger and thirst for things. Like if Jesus was here and never took a bite of eat and never drank anything, people would be like, wait a minute. Something weird about this guy. All right? He lives in the desert in the Middle East. He's going to get thirsty. 
That's why it was a, a temptation for him when Satan comes and he says, hey, I will turn these rocks into bread. Why? Because Jesus got hungry. He was fully human. If he's just God, he goes, I don't need to eat. I'm God. Just, yep, just fill my stomach, right? I, I, I mean, he could. Right? If he's fully God, it's just like, he's like, I don't even need to eat. Just need water. <laughs> I just, like, I mean, just think about it, right? If he is human, so he has these things. He hungers and he thirsts, right? He ate, right? He was hungry, so he ate. Luke 24, he slept. Jesus slept. Think of, like, he has 33 years on earth, three, three years where he had this focus of ministry, and he, and he slept. Why? Because he was human. He had a need to sleep. It's Luke chapter 8. He faced that temptation. We just talked about that. Matthew 4. But, like, unique to Jesus, he resisted it. You and I have been tempted, right? But we've given in to it. But full of God, he was tempted. Or, full of man, he was tempted. Full of God, he resisted that temptation. Proving that he is uniquely a position to take care of your greatest need, my greatest need. That is, we have a debt that cannot be paid. A sacrifice must be made. And he is the only acceptable sacrifice as a sinless man. Why is he sinless? Because he's fully God. But he's also 100% human as well. And so his blood can be shed. His life can be given for you and I. That's why we die in that mountain. Because if he's not God, he cannot pay the price for my sin. If he's not man, he has no life to give for my sin. It's important. It's worth dying on that mountain. Like the implications of that. Fully God and fully man, Jesus is the only one who has both the authority and the means to be a sufficient sacrifice for my sins. Fully man, but not fully God. He's got a physical like, body to be sacrificed, but it's no different than Jake, the good guy, saying, hey, I'm going to take a bullet for you. Thank you, Jake. But my sins aren't like, taken, taken care of. I still have that because you are not a perfect sacrifice. I could not be a perfect sacrifice for you. Only a sinless God could do that fully God, but not fully man, he would have the authority, he would have the sinlessness, but what is the sacrifice? What is the sacrifice? If he's just a God that comes down and says, yes, it's taken care of, is the wrath of God, is the judgment that's on my life taken care of? The sacrifice must be made. Payment must happen. Fully God, fully man, he's able to do that. He's sinless, and he's able to offer himself. If he's not God, my sin debt hasn't been paid. If he's not God, he's a heretic, and his teachings should not be listened to. That's one of the craziest things that people are like, well, he's not God. It's like, well, with all he claimed, he's either a nut job or he's God. <laughs> right, right, like, because if you say that he's not God, then don't listen to a word that he said because he just sounds like a crazy man if he's not God. He's just like that guy you hear on the street like corner just saying that he's seeing just like unicorns and stuff and lightsaber fights. Like, you don't pay attention to that guy. You think that guy's crazy. But the stuff that Jesus claimed, the stuff that he said about himself, the stuff that's said about him, he either is that or he's not worth you even paying any sort of attention to. What, do, what we do with Jesus is the crux of our faith. That's why we die in this mountain. Because if I cannot see him as fully God and fully man, my faith is worthless. Like the gospel means nothing. Because my sin hasn't been paid for. I'm still going to die in my sin and spend eternity apart from God. There is no hope. The thing is, Jesus is fully God, fully man. And he did pay the price. And I will die in that mountain every chance I get. Not to be corny, but because... Because he died on the cross, I can die on that mountain. That I can say, this is where I stand. I'm not going to be moved from it. I cannot come off of this because I love you too much. Even if you're my absolute worst enemy in this whole world, I love you too much to let you think there's any other way. If Jesus is anything less than fully God and fully man, the gospel is cheap and it makes it worthless. We're wasting our time here if he's not that. It's important. It's something to die on. Whether someone wears a white robe in the baptismal or wears shorts and a t-shirt or a tank top and I don't know, whatever. That doesn't matter. We don't die on that. But we die on this. Jesus was 100% God, 100% man. Nothing will move us from that. There's a quote from a fellow named C.S. Lewis. You may have heard, heard this before, but it's from his book, Mere Christianity. 
And we'll close with this. He says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, him being God. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg. That's British speak for breakfast, I think. Right? Or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And, and consequentially, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. That sums it up better than I could ever say. But the God that laid down his life for you, if you do not accept him as God, he cannot just be a good teacher that you learn some principles from. Think about the things he said. You must leave your father and mother and follow me. Let the dead bury the dead. If you, things like, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. If you're in downtown St. Louis and someone says that to you, you're not like, you are a good teacher, right? No. He was either God himself or of no consequence for you to pay, to pay any sort of attention to. It's a mountain we die on. Next week we'll talk about another um, aspect of that. Again, we always want to have some sort of application, but the application here is, do I know the foundations of my faith? Do I really I believe this stuff? Is my life built on that? Or do I just kind of trust that, hey, Jesus had some good things to say. That's not the gospel. But the gospel is that the God of the universe loved you so much that despite your sin and your, and your, and your rebellion from him, he came down to earth fully God, fully man, lived a sinless life, positioned himself like uniquely to be the one who could pay for your sin and for mine and died on a cross for you and for me. Not so I could see him as a good teacher, but so I could see him as the God of the universe who loved me and gave himself for me. And what I do with that changes everything about my life.